Welcome back to ArtofDino.com with an excellent book that I've discovered combining great art with some cool, you know, thoughts and descriptions of some amazing places in India with the Hindus. And 24 views in Hindustan, Mr. Chase's celebrated collection of pictures mis painted by Mr. Daniel and Colonel Ward. Thank you both for documenting these things. That must have been one amazing trip to go around India at the 1700s, 1800s and checking these sites out before I don't even know. It, it's, it just always blows my mind about how the, you know British and India have interlocked in a way, and how those they're almost two different like species of being, like with different energies that are, are just you know they clashed at times, and it's just it's wild to think. It makes me always think that there's more beyond the poles. That there's just probably thousands of races of people that are all different. All different sizes, all different sh breeds, shapes, combinations of everything. Just the animals can talk. It's all, I have a feeling there's so much beyond the poles. My imagination constantly goes, and the Indians always help push that. The Buddhas, all of them. It's so good. So I wanted to show about four descriptions uh, of these. I'm going to take four of them and read the descriptions and talk about them, and then I'm going to blast through a bunch of drawings at the end that are just really cool from two different books. This book as well, ancient. Oh, just amazing, awesome India stuff from Mysore, that one is. You'll see some great pictures. And here are some really cool descriptions. So I'm going to start with this very first one, which is a chul tree or a chal tree. I don't know how. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Cart out of the rock of Trechinopoly, which will be the fourth one today. So I'll show you that. I think the fourth one. But either way, I'm very curious about this. I still don't know if this explains what the central object is. But um, I love what this conjures up. So here we go. This curious temple is excavated from the Massey Rock and contains some masterly workmanship by the Hindus. The pillar in the center is of solid brass, gilt, and about 50 feet high. It supports at the top various flags, which are used as signals for prayers, and may be seen on account of the height of the rock at a distance of 30 miles over the surrounding country. So that seems like a pretty good use right there. 30 miles at a distance of that is pretty remarkable to be able to see that. Nowadays you can barely see anything with all the smoke that they're filling this place with. But wow, that makes a lot of sense. And I wonder if it has also energy res resonating properties, if it made some sound, if different areas of it, if you tapped it, would make some kind of thing, or if it, it definitely did something magical as well at the base. Maybe there's something electrical, etherical, who knows? So cool. Either way, flags 30 miles away, that's very impressive. The small white building in the center of the picture is composed of silver and it contains the most adored gods of the Hindus. At the entrance of this chamber are the remains of an antique bull sculptured from granite. The man who is seen standing near the pillar of brass is a Brahmin. No European or inferior caste of the Hindus is permitted to enter the temple, for it is held in such veneration by the Maharadas that if any person of the above description were at the present day to attempt to enter the inner apartment or sanctum sanctorum, the Brahmins would immediately murder him. So do not do that. With respect, I wonder what's in there. Though. I wonder what they're protecting and everything. And I wonder if it's been able to make it to today or if it's in a museum or some private collection somewhere that nobody gets to appreciate, which is would be a bummer. Hopefully it's with the natives and with true people that are actually utilizing it with respect. And here we go. With respect to the origin of chul trees, they seem to have had their rise in the hospitality of the natives, blended with that religious awe which forms the most striking and laudable trait in their character. They consider a person upon a journey as a sacred object, and the primary intent of the chul trees is to supply his wants. Amazing. They are nearly similar to the caravans arrays of Egypt and Arabia, and travelers may enter them, rest, dress their provisions, and retire without any demand being made upon them. How good is that? I wish we lived in a place, in a world, where this could still go on. And, you know, hostels kind of preserved that for a while. I'm not sure. I haven't been in the hostel scene in a while. But either way, this is much more spiritual. And the fact that they respect and treat the spiritual wanderer just amazingly is really the way in a world I want to live in. And I'd love to uh, experience this on a massive scale where people are just embracing the wonderful and being good enough to trust and helping each other out and making the journey for everyone incredible that's the goal 
So here we go, without any demand being made upon them. And though it would be more gratifying if food were provided for them, yet the accommodation of shelter in a climate where the heat is always almost insupportable is, it must be allowed, of no ordinary kind. So that's good. The Choltries, like other Indian edifices, often vary in size and convenience, but in general they are large and commodious, and each of them is attended by a man, who is occupied in keeping them clean. The first traveler who arrives takes possession of the place as if it were his own, and on the appearance of another, the former makes room for him, and so on until the Choltri is full. On reaching one of these retreats in the evening, each traveler lays down to sleep, and Indians mix together indiscriminately, but if a European is present, they politely leave him a corner to himself. So that's see that's the the blend and they're so nice that they leave him. They don't think about harming them like the others tend to inevitably think about harming them. It's it's crazy. I really do every time it makes me believe that we're people are so unique around the world that we're so different that there just must be thousands of us around the world around this full realm if you kept going in every direction there's some amazing things people giants midgets massive amazing mixes and uh, who knows but i guarantee it's so cool like Imagine like the, the telepathics or the people that mastered certain things in each direction. The web just keeps expanding of potential in life and hope we discover that someday. That would be really sweet. So here we go. Keep going. These buildings are found near almost every village, but being situated out of the main road, they are not frequented by the majority of travelers, particularly Europeans who prefer stopping at any public house in the towns where they can procure accommodation by purchase. <laughs> Amongst the opulent natives, the building of these edifices can considered as an atonement for sins, and a man loaded with crimes, and who may have acquired his riches by the most illicit means, is convinced that he shall enjoy eternal felicity if he have erected two or three choltries. Interesting. Kind of cool how they uh, keep that going there with the uh, pass it on, passing the buck, and I still wonder what the ancient uh, purpose was, and maybe some of those are built on ancient places, and just... Whew, always think about what these mountains once were. So here we go, let's go on to the next one. And I've also got my mic back. Botched that at the beginning, sorry about that. Here we go. Southeast view of the rock of Trichinopoly, speaking of, 204 miles from Madras. Look at that thing. I, again, I don't know what the ancient thing was, a tree, oh, I wish we could see the prime, or just have a glimpse of the prime of this uh, universe. But again, we get places like this still, which is amazing because it feeds the imagination. So here we go. Taken within the walls of the fort, it is ascended by the serpentine steps that have many spacious landing places, which turn off to excavations of considerable magnitude, some of which are used as powder magazines, and others, with the assistance of masonry, are converted into pagodas. On the summit is an extensive choultry or open colonnade, which commands a, res a prospect of 20 or 30 miles. Wow. The building near it, in which abrupts upon the edge of the rock, is a pagoda, with the residence of the Brahmins belonging to it. The interior of the buildings is, in the order of their construction, grand and sublime, and has frequently attracted the admiration of scientific men. <sighs> Wow, I wonder what this place is. What mysteries that thing stores? Who built that? Who could have possibly built that? How could it not be giants? How could it absolutely not be giants? And again, how could it not be just a remnant of something way deeper that has no name, that has no fathomability, that has no trace left? That's what needs to be found. And Jainism and Hinduism, they get the closest, I think, and Buddhism and Tartarian, they all got the closest. But it's slipping away like the stars that we can that are just becoming less and less everywhere. The, the sky is becoming less and less blue. It's all synonymous of each other. We have to figure it out. Keep digging. God. All right, here we go. Number three. All right, now number 11, the west gate of Firaz Shah's Kotia. In the pictures I got, I'm, I kind of think it's the same thing, so don't hold me to it, but I think it is. So here we go. This view represents the west gate of Firaz Shah's residence at Delhi. It is of very remote antiquity and conveys to the spectator a grand idea of the Hindu knowledge of architecture at that distant period. 
That sweet distant period. It also contains evidently much of the Gothic order, the origin of which is so strongly disputed at the present day. I agree. The Gothic stuff is just that they the history's got it totally wrong. There's something there that's just of an eternal mystery. In this vicinity is the structure called the Pillar of Firaz Shah, containing several ancient inscriptions in unknown characters, and some in the Sanskrit language, which have been translated. The passages which are understood are poetical eulogies on the wisdom of the Shah. Wow, I wonder what that contains. And Oh my, what did it look like in its prime? Remote antiquity. It's just, at least they were thinking about it at this time. And it makes you wonder again, like, you know, but they knew they were getting published, so that's a whole nother mentality. But again, you know, how high did that go? How big did it go? What was it covered in? How, what color was it? Because all of this is gone. It's just, we just see the dust of it in, in heaps all over the place. What happened? Ah, I hope we figure it out. We must figure it out. It's such a mystery. And here we go. This one, wow. The Fortress of Gwalior. I've never seen a thing like that except like Roraima in Brazil or tree stumps, and the Devil's Tower. But this is, looks a little different, and it's very incredible. Here we go. Gwalior is undoubtedly... This is number 16, the Fortress of Gwalior. And I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but whatever. Gwalior is undoubtedly one of the most ancient, important, and astonishing fortifications in India, as it must have been a military post from the earliest age. Yeah, okay. These guys were just like, couldn't... <laughs> making the most spiritual stuff of all time. And uh, they're trying... And, uh, but yet they got like... They're making this massive military thing that's of pure beauty. <laughs> These people have a certain, um, just a totally different mind. It's it really is like the British in that, like this kind of thing that's taken over that we're all part of. I'm a part of it too. Whatever is is from somewhere else. It's something different than this spiritual residence that we're here. You know, it's uh, whew, who knows. Here we go. It is situated in the center of Hindostan, being about 80 miles to the south of Agra and 130 miles from the nearest part of the Ganges. By the nearest route from Calcutta, its distance is about 800 miles and about 280 from the British frontiers. In the detailed histories of India, it is mentioned as the capital of a district which formerly produced a considerable revenue, and some circumstances relative to it are stated to have occurred as early as the year 1008. <sighs> In the two succeeding centuries, it appears to have been three times reduced by famine, as the peculiarity of its site always rendered it impregnable against the assailants of the early ages. Its situation is of considerable importance in a military view, as it stands on the principal road leading from Agra to Mawa, Guzarat, and the Deccan, and near the spot where the road enters the hilly track which advances from Bundal Bundalan. This guy's like salivating over the military uh, usage of this. And it is a colonel who drew, who painted it, and uh, I'm not sure who wrote it exactly, uh, if what his role is, but... <sighs> so interesting the mindset and sad but its possession was always deemed necessary by the ruling emperors of Hindustan and its palace was used as a state prison from AD 1317 till the fall of the empire interesting amidst the vicissitudes which have taken place in India the fortress has of course fallen into the possession of various masters on the dismemberment of the empire it fell into a raja to the Jats who assumed the government of the district under the title of Rana of Gohud. In 1780, it was in the possession of the Maharatha chief Mad Madichi Sindhya, and at the time, our government being in alliance with the Rana, whose district was overrun by the Maharathas, it became an object of importance to draw Sindhya from the western side of India, where he was watching the motions of General Goddard in the Gujarat. The reduction of Gwalior was therefore resolved on, and the expedition was entrusted to the gallant officer, Major W. Popham, now Major General Popham, as mentioned in the brief history prefixed to this work, the sides of the rock being nearly perpendicular and about 300 feet from the plain below, with a rampart running around the edge of the precipice, the only way to ascend it was by means of rope and wooden ladders, which were prepared with the greatest secrecy, and so confident were the garrison of their security against surprise that they regularly retired to sleep between every round of the watch. The party who were appointed to make the first attempt advanced on the night of the 3rd of August in woolen shoes and being conducted to the most accessible part of the rock by a few banditti who had been in the habit of secreting themselves about it 
they succeeded in fixing a rope ladder to the battlements, with which they scaled the wall, surprised the garrison, and in the space of two hours gained complete possession of the fortress, without the loss of a man killed and only twenty wounded. So, wow, that is a quite complex thing, because I'm sure they were, con I mean, they had to protect these things always, but <sighs> this force, it's always, it's the duality, it just, just keeps going and going, and always has, I guess, and there's so much involved in the way this world works, and it's, it's absolutely nuts. So, um, wow, so keep thinking about it, and, um, Let's take a look at some of these uh, amazing little pictures here that are that continued and just keep going. These, this book is just really beautiful artwork in general and really incredible scenes. They pick great scenes and I wonder if there was just like so much, you know, that they had to select certain things. But, you know, probably just random things popping out of the ground in places during this time and... You never know what happens. All of this doesn't make sense as far as the population and the way we've seen population growth like in our parents' lifetime compared to, uh, you know, just if that's just the way it goes with time mo mostly, you know, when things are going pretty good and you don't have depopulation programs running rampant, then um, it seems like this place would have been very, po very highly populated. And a bunch of people have talked about this as well. And you can't help thinking about it. But um, I still do think we're not overpopulated. I think we've got plenty of room, plenty of room to grow. And we could, put, we could be dust in this world with wild berries and stuff and have wild edible fruits all over the place. But in there's so much land as well. It's that, that overpopulation thing is just nonsense. But either way, it seems like populations grow so big, so quick that um, you know designed for a place that has no boundaries pretty much and uh, I bet there's plenty of accommodations all over the place however uh, in our little zone people are being distracted and designed to just ignore the magic and thankfully a lot of people in this community and people out there a lot of places all over the place all over the world are battling to keep this place magic and keep it amazing and make people remember and talk about stuff like this always blows my mind when people can't like talk about just like wondering you know like why like it just doesn't make any sense when people get mad about just talking about something that is hypothetical or just imaginative and uh but people do I mean, it's quite a quite a reaction but when wondering about the ancient stuff, you know, with no boundaries, it's uh, it's pretty sweet. It's 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 unstoppable, and it's it really just opens the mind to a lot of amazing potential of what this world could become or what lies beyond. I say that a bunch, but it's 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 a factor. It's 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 one of those things that is just factored into my my thoughts. And as an as it is, it it expands everything. It expands the potential of so much, and it connects with all these all the trees, the ancient mass of trees and Tartaria, and just so much more. Everything. It all connects in some way. And uh, I know one of us is going to land upon it and just bridge it all together, or find the next piece of the puzzle that's just like wow you know and more people knew about these things and knew about you know the catacombs and just how massive they were and if you know maybe there's a way to orchestrate it so that all this information is together in one artwork or one book or something that's just designed to expand people's minds because it really is a healthy thing too and i wonder how how that feeds into um certain mental um diseases or things of the brain uh, and injuries uh, are related to how people think and if they uh, is you know closing yourself off you know adds to depression anxiety all these things yeah, while freeing your mind leads to other things and they've you know they fight it we've been fighting f getting a f having a free mind for a long time and the um, the Hindus and when you look at these ancient cultures their minds appear to be as free as beyond fathomability as free as absolutely just possible and living in a world where you know they're 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 doing what it takes to survive and their um, the religion and their spirituality is just a huge part of their of their goals they don't want to they don't like aren't thinking about their bank accounts and how much money they're gonna they're gonna uh, like make and uh, any of that stuff they're just kind of like existing in a a beautiful realm and it's still in the skeleton of something that was even more ridiculous and and I and 
look at the height of, of someone that could fit through that other spot and those archways and the fact that you can just feel that there was at one point metal, crystals, jewels all over the place, colors everywhere, like you find in some places like Tibet and other style, but that was everywhere. And it's all, but all that we get in our time period now is just a collection of things strategically designed to make us think a certain way and keep us in a certain zone. And so I uh, hope this all helps to just blast through it. And uh, that picture, this thing right here, wow, amazing. And I've, I think I've seen that in reality or in pictures now too. And just the detail, the per the purpose, like. Ooh. <sighs> It's, it's so nice to think about, so refreshing. Indian people, people of every part of the world, all the native people of this world, we gotta bring it all back. The Hawaiians, you gotta preserve it. You can't have that place turn into a smart city. The whole world needs to unite to for these causes, to bring this back, to keep things this way, to guide things this way, instead of the way they want. Just uh, very nice, in harmony with nature, you know? There's no litter, there's no trash, there's no nastiness all over the place. The, like it, we just I mean, we have a lot more things now, and uh, we need to do with it do with it very smart. And I, I hope we all can get together and uh, make it work and bring things back and go on excavation excavations and find new stuff and put it all together in a real way. And uh, maybe then the people beyond the poles will be like, ah, all right, let's go down there and say what's up to these guys and let's open the gates and uh, invite them in and find some new land. If it happens, I hope it happens during our life because this moon stuff is absolute nonsense and we might as well just go down or outwards in other directions because we are wasting our time shooting for the moon with how pathetic these missions, these billion trillion dollar missions are giving us. It's weird almost how, <laughs> how they are, but we got to go down, we got to go out, we got to find, we got to go back in time, we got to figure out just more, we got to get information we got to get all this stuff so we can learn and rediscover our true purpose, magic, and everything. So I'm going to shut up there because I think I've just been absolutely rambling. So for the next two minutes, enjoy these pictures. And I hope you enjoyed this. If not, you know, go back, turn me off, and just look at the art. It's really incredible. And look at that rock. What was that? A tree, a mushroom, a massive building, something from underneath, a crystal, something. Uh, it was definitely something of purpose. And again, that. Uh, can't stop. All right, here you go. Put your thoughts below. I love hearing them, love reading them, and uh, bless you all.